bottom of the navigation bar to choose Spanish. We're also going to have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So I encourage you to please use the Q&A function again at the bottom of the navigation bar. This site event, I'm happy to report, is made possible by cultural survival and minority and our partners, such as Minority Rights Group International and the Maya Leaders Alliance of Southern Belize. If you want to learn more about the work that we do, I encourage you to visit our respective website. Monica, we cannot hear you. Can I? Can you unmute yourself? We still cannot hear you. Okay, can you try again? No, we can't. Your audio, for some reason, is not working. We cannot hear you. <clears throat> All right, why don't we go to the first panelist and um, Monica can, can see if you can log out and log back in, please. Um, we would like to introduce Eunice. Shekim Shempen Kimoy. I'm sorry, I just um Eunice. If you if you could please introduce yourself. So Eunice is a gender and youth officer at OGIC People's Development Program and has over 10 years experience of work in promoting indigenous people's rights. She has been working with the OGIC community as a hunter and gatherer. Uh, um, a hunter-gatherer community residing in parts of the Mao Forest in Kenya, as well as other indigenous communities in Kenya. She's passionate about, about um, women's issues, and she is a member of the Indigenous Women's Council, a Kenyan network of indigenous women. She's also a member of the Protection Group Defenders Coalition and has been championing the rights of indigenous women and girls. She represents the organization in women and ESCR net working group on issues of housing, land and natural resources. She has been participating in various meetings on indigenous issues, both at the local, national, regional and international levels. And she's been working with OGIC women in various projects, including uh, promoting collective land rights, struggles, livelihood, empowerment programs, cultural issues. So um, thank you for being here, Ms. Eunice, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. I'm happy to be one of the panelists in this discussion. And I would like to uh, present on the issues of um, the Ogia community and uh, the environment conservation, how they relate in conservation and uh, the current situation and how it has impacted them. So- um, Can I just ask if, if it's okay, if you could oh, turn on your camera, if that's possible, because your camera is not on right now. Thank you. 
Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, we'd like to present about uh, the Ogia community and their role in uh, environment conservation. So Ogia community, it is um, it means actually uh, the caretakers of plant and animals. That is, they are the custodians of biodiversity and they inhabit uh, part of Mao Forest in Kenya. And they have a population of 52,000. That is as per the national census that was carried out in 2019. Traditionally, the Oge, they are hunters and gatherers, and they have uh, distinctive histories of interaction with the natural environment. The Oge depend on forest and forest resources for their livelihood. That is, it is a place where they get um, food like meat, the wild fruits and honey. And for decades, they have really coexisted with the ecosystem. However, because of the invasion that has gradually rendered them homeless in Mao Forest, they have been um, be they have been facing eviction. And uh, because of that eviction, they have been uh, they have uh, resorted to the corridors of justice, like the case which we had at the African uh, court. The case was filed in 2009 at the African Commission, but because of the massive violation that was going on within the community, the, uh, the African Commission decided to referring the case to the African court. So the court actually um, delivered the judgment of the case in 2017 at the Af uh, on, in favor of the Ogia community. They recognized the Ogia community as indigenous and they have a bigger role in protecting the environment. So um, the Ogia community, they have a special uh, authority and competence actually in protecting of uh, their own environment because of the traditional knowledge that they have. The Ogia society, they facilitated the generational of knowledge by raising awareness on the need to conserve Mao forest. Remember that uh, this is their home and uh, to ensure that it is sustained, they have to come up with the strategies on how they can ensure it is well protected. So the OGEC, they have a holistic understanding of their physical environment and the responsibility for improving conservation, including uh, protecting uh, the rich biodiversity of animals and the plant species. Like the way um, the OGEC community were making uh, beehives, um, there is a way, there is a special way in which uh, that it, in which it is done to ensure that uh, the tree is not drying up. You see, the traditional beehives uh, is being made from a bark of the trees. So there is a special way in which Ogiek used to remove the barks of the trees, and. Um, because of that, the continued protection of the biodiversity, Ogiek had plenty of honey, which they used to eat. They had um, the wild animals, there were many, but now because of the massive destruction that have been uh, experienced in Mao Forest, there is now little honey in the Ogiek and also uh, animals they have uh, migrated. So for the Ogia community, they really value trees. And uh, cutting down, down of trees among the Ogia community, it was forbidden. And, uh, and because of that, if you want to cut any tree, it was done under strict regulation. So no one was allowed to, get, to cut down tree without, um, without the permission from the elders. And then uh, trees within the community it was recognized as an important living because for one, it was used for cultural values. Some trees were specifically used to perform cultural traditions, especially uh, during initiation of the boys and also performing of the rituals. It, um, also, there is issue about the medicinal values. Most of the trees, they were used to treat ailments like uh, cold, and also pneumonia among others. So uh, the Ogiek, they did know the issue of uh, going to the hospital. So their hospital was in the forest. They will go to the forest and get the medicinal herbs 
and treat the diseases. And then also the issue of pollination. Uh, there are specific trees that are good actually in pollination. And that one, it was helping in promoting a production of honey within the community. But now because of the destruction that has been uh, uh, seen that is going on and uh, the infeding of the Mao forest by other communities, little now is harvested among the Oge community. So the situation has that now there are no hubs. The hubs right now for you to get you have, you need to travel for a longer distance to go and harvest those hubs. The animals like hyrax, which they used to prepare um, their traditional clothes, they are no longer there. And if they are, you, you cannot easily get them. The animals have migrated. And then there is also um, the issue of water catchment areas. They are drying up because people have cut trees and some have resort resorted to doing farming. And because of that, they do, um, they do cultivation even uh, along the riverbanks, which has lead some of the rivers which used to flow throughout the year has now become uh, seasonal. And then again, there is a change in rainfall of um, uh, rainfall patterns. That is uh, in the past, the elders, they used to know, um, they had specific symbols which showed that this time it is rainy, this time it is not raining. So there is total change. And um, that one, it has really affected the production, the food security within the Ogier community. So uh, because of that, some of the efforts which we've been employing as Ogier People's Development Program to ensure there is continuity in protecting of the environment. One is about, um, we recruited a team of community forest scouts and uh, this team of the community forest scouts, they are working in partnership with the Kenya Forest Service, which is a government agency to ensure that there is a conservation of the forest. They man the forest against any illegal activities. And because of the work they have done, it has really demonstrated that um, the Ogier community, they have a bigger role in protecting the environment. The trees have been regenerating. The animals that had migrated, they are now coming back. So that is something that had not been seen for a very long time. And then secondly, there is issue of development of community biocultural protocol. The Ogier community right now, they have the, that edition of their um, community biocultural protocol. So this is a tool which they have been using to negotiate uh, with the decision makers about the, their cultural values in safeguarding actually the biodiversity. So uh, it has been very active and the community have continued to use it. And uh, this community biocultural protocol, it was one of the tools uh, that was used during the case. It provided evidence to show that uh, the Ogier community, they are playing a bigger role in protection of the forest. And if we didn't have that, it could have been difficult to argue. So it was one of the proof at the court that shows that uh, the Ogio community are taking part in protection of the forest. Uh, and then there is rehabilitation program. So in this um, Ogio People's Development Program, we are working in, uh, in partnership with the community by planting trees, especially in areas uh, where there is a depletion, that is the degraded parts of the forest to ensure that we restore the bio, uh, biodiversity loss. So this one we are bringing together the uh, all members of the community, both men, women, and youths, and they've been taking a bigger role in that. They have also learned it is very important to continue doing a protection and conservation of the forest. 
And then there is also establishment of the projects that are nature friendly. Uh, we know that if we don't implement uh, activities that can support uh, the, sup the support in protection of the environment, it will be difficult to ensure that we continue protecting. And how we are doing it is uh, we are using our community organized groups like uh, women, uh, youth, and also men so that they can ensure that they practice uh, activities like beekeeping and also establishment of uh, tree nursery. We are happy that uh, beekeeping, which used to be uh, an initiative for men or a practice being done by men, is now uh, practiced by women. They are taking a bigger role. And uh, we have seen that it is uh, they are doing a good job. So women are taking... Um, they are taking part in in beekeeping projects and then um there is also issue of a developing of herbarium gardens these are gardens which consist of uh, herbal medicines and also indigenous trees we want to ensure that the herbal medicines which the community have been using have be, are now um they have they are now uh, closer to the community so we have um we have a team of uh, herbalists within the community who have been taking part in this and uh, we are see it is bringing a lot of the, they are doing a lot of connection and we are doing it in collaboration with the county governments and then also we are doing continuous awareness of the and capacity building of the community to ensure that uh, they, they have a lot of knowledge and understanding on the protection of, um, of environment and also to understand the laws that govern their environmental rights. So that is something which we've been doing. And we can say that the Ogier community as forest people, they play a significant role in environment conservation and the government should not stop in prioritizing their interest and putting their own interest in front, but rather the, to consider that the rights of Ogier community, their human rights and their well-being, it is put in front. So that is all I can present. Thank you very much. Thank you very <laughs> much, Ms. Eunice. We, we appreciate your time and we're happy to learn from you. Again, um, for those of you that are just joining us, we apologize for the little mishap that we had in respect of technology um, issues. Again, we are here on the topic on the front lines, criminalization of and violence against indigenous peoples and indigenous land defenders. As you very well know, as the world continues to be threatened by climate change effects, the pressure and attraction to indigenous territories is ever increasing on, as they are the one of the last remaining well-preserved areas. And so unfortunately, indigenous peoples, as they continue to protect these lands, they often find themselves at the, the forefront or on the front lines of direct attacks uh, to their safety and well-being in defense of their lands. So our goal here today is to highlight not only the struggles of indigenous peoples as they defend their territories and as they defend mother nature, but to also to illustrate their incredible contributions to the protection of, of mother nature. And so I'm happy to, to, to um, present to you our next presenter and her name is Ms. Arkana Sereng and she belongs to the Kadia uh, tribe from Odisha, India. She is one of the seven members of the UN Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change. She is experienced in research and advocacy and has been working to document, preserve, and promote the traditional knowledge and practices of indigenous communities. She holds a master's degree in regulatory governance from Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai. She has been working as a research officer with the Sundahara, a policy advocacy organization that works on natural resource governance, biodiversity conservation, 
sustainable livelihoods and climate action. And Ms. Arcana, we welcome, and we are happy to have you here today uh, to learn more from you and more about the work that you do. So our question for you today is, what is the correlation between traditional knowledge and practices of indigenous peoples to natural resource governance, biodiversity conservation, sustainable livelihoods, and climate action? That's part one. And the second part is what are some of the challenges facing indigenous peoples in your community as they engage in self-determined climate change solutions? The floor is yours, you have six minutes, thank you. Uh, Johar, uh, hi everyone. It's uh, a pleasure to be here interacting with you all. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful uh, to receive this opportunity to have this interaction and conversation with you all. Uh, starting in with uh, the traditional knowledge and practices of indigenous communities and local communities and uh, how they have been engaging in climate action, biodiversity, uh, conservation and ecosystem restoration. I would like to start that the entire worldview of indigenous people and local communities for us, like as a young uh, indigenous women, I see that for us, nature is a source of identity, culture, tradition and language. We believe that we are not mere part of nature, but nature. And this also brings down to the perspective that for us, nature has been a source of our livelihood, a source of our protection, a source of our shelter, and also has been like how we look up to nature as mother, taking care of nature, and also have been in a relationship where we are, we respect her and we take care of her, which also brings down that how world has seen land, forest, and nature as commercial commodities, unlike the indigenous communities. And this, I bring down to how for us, uh, taking care of nature or being part of nature is a way of living. And when I say is often indigenous people are being told that what do you do to protect nature and how you have been doing so what's the traditional knowledge and practices but for me most importantly it's not what we do but who we are and what is our relationship with nature and this also brings down to me to share my thoughts in terms of two ways like one is through a community-led forest protection practices through our governance institution through a belief system through a worldview we have been protecting nature nature because we see nature as more closer and more dear to us uh, and then i also feel that as a way of living we have been living a sustainable way of living wherein we are practicing organic uh, 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 unsustainable farming practices multiple cropping practices where we have been uh, using alternatives to plastic like making leaf plates and also making tables chairs and different articles in a sustainable way and apart from that, I also feel that in terms of how we have been looking up to nature in terms of traditional knowledge and practices, there are rainwater harvesting, there are community-led forest protection practices and multiple different initiatives taken by the community members. And there, I feel that it, when we talk about uh, contribution, I think it's very important to also acknowledge that there has been immense report and evidence to show that the area, the forest where community members are protecting are has been more in a sustainable way and has been very crucial in terms of climate mitigation, which also brings down to me to the fact that how there has been also like I have been often saying that indigenous people should be leaders of climate action, not victims of climate policies. And when I say this, it's very important uh, to highlight that how in the name of climate policy, Sees. Often we see there has been gross human rights violation. In the name of biodiversity conservation, we see there is gross human rights violation, which again brings down to be the fact where I have been witnessing and observing that if we take into consideration the entire climate action discourse, climate mitigation and cl climate adaptation, there has been an immense vicious circle of violation for the indigenous people. In the name of climate mitigation, in order to curb the car carbon emission, that has been pushed forward for afforestation programs. And these 
afforestation prog programs we see that often has been done by cutting off natural forest and doing an artificial plantation. We also see that in the name of afforestation, the indigenous people, the local communities have been evicted from their areas and their lands are banned, which again makes it very vulnerable for indigenous people and local communities to adapt uh, to the climate crisis, to adapt to the impacts of climate crisis. And that's why I feel the climate mitigation and the climate adaptation needs to be taken in a holistic perspective, where rights recognition of indigenous people over the land, forest and territories needs to be an integral part of this policy making process where the traditional knowledge and practices of indigenous and local communities needs to be supported and adopted in the, the climate policy which again brings down to me to the fact that as we are discussing in line of uh united nation permanent forum uh on indigenous issues 21st uh, uh session i would like to say that free prior and informed consent is very very crucial uh for us indigenous and local communities because i feel it's really important that we ensure that the community members are taken into consideration when we are having this climate policies formulated, uh, framed and structured and implemented, which also brings down to me to share a small example of my field research is that when I was interacting with an indigenous leader in my regions, I asked him like, uh, he told me that they have been protesting uh, and uh, they do not want a uh, plantation in the region. And I was like, why are you protesting? And what is the reason of not allowing plantation in your region? So the community leader said that they are bringing fruit trees to plant in my region. And I was like, what's the problem with fruit trees? And then the community leader said that if they bring fruit trees like jackfruit and mangoes, then wildlife will come uh, I, in order to destroy uh, 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 the agriculture practices in the periphery of the region which also took me aback like being indigenous people myself but i didn't know this context because this context is very different and then which made me realize that it's so so important to make indigenous people an integral part of this processes because indigenous people those who are on the ground know very well of their areas and know very well what is happening in the region and that's why they it uh, they need to be part of this processes and at the end i would like to sum up by saying that when we speak about gross human rights violation of indigenous uh, of indigenous people and local communities i would like to say that our ancestors and our elders have been protecting the biodiversity have been protecting the nature at the cost of their life, at the cost of their identity, and at the cost of a traditional knowledge and practices. I would like to say that when we are talking about development, it's really important to uh, take into consideration how there has been imposition of developmental worldview. And when there are such climate policies or policies framed, it's very important to put it across development for who, by who, and for what. Nothing at the cost of indigenous people needs to be done. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Ms. Sereng. And we welcome your presentation. You are very correct that we're not, indigenous peoples don't merely see themselves as a part of, of, of nature, but nature itself. Very powerful statement um, coming from Ms. Sereng. And it's absolutely true that we do need to acknowledge the incredible contributions of indigenous peoples to these climate change solutions that we begin, when we begin to talk about climate change, we, ha we have to involve and include indigenous peoples because we carry millennia old knowledge as guardians of the lands, the waters, the biodiversity uh, and the living things around us. And so um, any solution needs to, to, to be holistic and it has to have have a rights-based component, one that upholds land tenure rights and resource uh, indigenous managed land projects. And in this way, we will ensure that we will have successful, successful solutions to um, climate change effects. So I want to invite our next speaker. Um, and her name is Ms. Margarita Pineda. She's indigenous Lenka. Uh, she's a human rights, land, and territory defender uh, from La Paz, Honduras, and is a member of the Lenca Indigenous Council, Hats of Progress. She is the coordinator 
of the of Women Indigenous Gender Equality Program in Milpa. And Ms. Pinedo has also worked since her youth on various social issues with different organizations and is passionate about human rights. Ms. Pineda, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, and our question for you this morning is, has, how has your community efforts to protect or preserve your lands and resources been received by the state or the dominant community? And what is the correlation between land tenure security and biodiversity conservation. Thank you, you have the floor. Buenos días. Gracias por invitarme a es, participar en este, en este foro. Eh, en nombre de mi pueblo Lenca, agradezco que estén visualizándonos con nuestra problemática que no es... Um, eh, única, sino que vemos que es a nivel mundial, según es, escucho a mis anteponentes, ¿no? Bueno, el movimiento indígena Lenca La Paz Honduras nace a partir del golpe de Estado en el 2009, cuando eh, se rompe eh, el Estado constitucional del país. Ahí nacemos porque se da en nuestros territorios en en concesiones, desmedido, algo que nunca se había visto. Entonces, eh, nosotros, eh, no, como pueblos originarios, nos vemos obligados a, a emprender una lucha cuando se empoderan de nuestros ríos. Es terrible la situación que se ha dado en estos 12 años de gobierno de facto, donde hemos sido despojados a nivel nacional no solo los pueblos indígenas, sino que el país donde se concesionó casi el 80% para zonas de empleo de desarrollo sedes, eh, para hidroeléctricas, para minería, para eólicas y un sinfín en eh, nuestros bosques para la explotación eh, internacional. Este gobierno que pasó... Eh, fue el único que firmó un pacto a nivel de Latinoamérica con la Unión Europea para la explotación de maderas. Porque Honduras eh, hemos sido eh, cuidadores, cuidadoras de nuestros bosques, de nuestro patrimonio ancestral. Entonces, eh, se, eh, fue terrible lo que se dio. Tenemos muchos... Uh, compañeros eh, que fueron asesinados, defensores y defensoras de derechos humanos, eh, desaparecidos. Eh, bueno, el caso de Berta Cáceres, que, que ya se sabe, pues una hermana lenca que nos ha dolido mucho su asesinato, eh, de compañero de mi municipio, Humberto Hernández, que fue asesinado por la empresa Aurora 1, y otros sinfín de compañeros y compañeras que eh, ya los derechos humanos internacionales, eh, la ONU y todo esto tiene, ha recibido información. Bueno, la verdad es que Milpa eh, hacemos, eh, hemos hecho todo tipo de, de acciones, protestas, eh, plantones, y hicimos de todo para que se nos escuchara, que no éramos, eh, que no teníamos eh, que se nos quitara nuestro territorio. Amparándonos en el convenio 169 de la OIT, como pueblos indígenas, pues hicimos toda una lucha. Y es ahí donde tuvimos muchos compañeros presos. Eh, por ejemplo, los compañeros de, de Suyapa, los compañeros de, del pueblo eh, en la costa norte, con los de Guapinol. Tenemos aún el caso de los compañeros y hermanos eh, garífunas que fueron secuestrados y desaparecidos por ser eh, líderes comunitarios luchando por su territorio, que aún no se sabe. Entonces, la lucha ha sido grande en Honduras durante este gobierno de facto. Y otra cosa, la lucha, por ejemplo, eh, para la sobrevivencia, eh, cultivando... Eh, nuestras semillas criollas, recuperando nuestra cultura ancestral, 
eh, medicinas y todo eso, la educación incluso, porque todo eso se vio eh, afectado y dañado por este sistema de gobierno. Entonces, quienes sufrimos más las consecuencias fuimos los pueblos indígenas porque eso nos despojó eh, de territorio, se nos despojó de educación, de salud. Y allí ha estado Milpa, el movimiento indígena Lenca, somos el movimiento eh, indígena más grande. Está en cinco departamentos, siete departamentos. Somos nueve pueblos originarios en Honduras y todos haciendo una lucha por la defensa de tierra, territorio, bienes comunes. Y gracias a Dios ahorita en diciembre, en noviembre que fuimos a, a la elección de un nuevo gobierno, pues ganamos, eh, eh, no podríamos decir socialismo ni eh, con llevar a una mujer históricamente en 200 años, eh, una mujer toma el poder por primera vez en este país y hicimos muchos convenios y ya se ha logrado liberar, por ejemplo, eh, los presos políticos están saliendo bajo un decreto legislativo, eh, se han liberado, eh, por ejemplo, la ley de las sedes, que fue lo más terrible que pudo haber hecho este sistema de gobierno en concesionar siete departamentos del país, de 19, se concesionaron siete para las, las ciudades eh, de desarrollo, mal llamado desarrollo, porque desarrollo para quién, como decía la que me antecedió, ¿verdad? ¿Para quién y, para, y por quiénes? Entonces, eh, no ha sido fácil la lucha indígena y, y seguimos. Es un reto que tenemos día a día, eh, hombres y mujeres, por nuestra cultura. Las mujeres también somos muy victimizadas porque no se nos quiere dar eh, eh, nuestro lugar en la toma de decisiones. Y mm, también tenemos que. Las asambleas, por ejemplo, ahorita Honduras o nosotros como pueblos originarios estamos luchando para que se nos tome en cuenta o para que el gobierno eh, eh, nos tome eh, con esto del, del acuerdo de Escazú. Estamos haciendo eh, un ahorita esta semana que pasó una asamblea para que también seamos eh, tomados en cuenta como, como pueblo eh, y que el gobierno pueda, pueda firmar este, este convenio y así pues con el convenio 169 que no se cumple, Honduras ha sido firmante en tres ocasiones del convenio y no se cumple, dicen que no está reglamentado, eh, pero ahí estamos haciendo la lucha, es la única sombría que tenemos como, como pueblo, eh, pueblos originarios y eh, la solidaridad y el apoyo de los demás pueblos hermanos indígenas a nivel, a nivel mundial. Porque sí hemos tenido, eh, ahora yo diría, pues gracias a ustedes, pues eh, nos unimos a una nueva red y viendo, eh, somos víctimas del mismo sistema, del mismo, de la misma explotación, el mismo cambio climático y estamos ahí. No es fácil que... Enfrentar esto, yo ahorita para conocimiento de ustedes he sido amenazada a muerte, es terrible, eh, tengo miedo porque así amenazaron a mi compañero hace un año y medio y lo, lo, o sea, lo mataron, lo fueron a matar a su casa frente a sus hijos, a su familia y entonces no es fácil, seguimos, el hecho de que eh, haya ganado un nuevo gobierno, las prácticas y lo mismo sigue, entonces eh, como defensores y defensoras de derechos humanos de los pueblos indígenas, eh, tenemos un reto muy grande, arriesgamos nuestras vidas, pero estamos ahí, porque si nosotros no lo hacemos, ¿quién lo va a hacer? Nuestras futuras generaciones, mis nietos, mis nietas, tienen derecho a que se les herede, eh, qué es lo que nuestros ancestros nos heredaron a nosotros. Y bueno, estamos allí. ¿Y qué les podré decir? Que las luchas por la defensa de la vida las hacemos creo que a nivel mundial y no cambia mucho el, el sufrir, el despojo, los ríos secos, el cambio climático, eh, que ha cambiado nuestros cultivos, eh, que los sembramos en marzo, ahora los tenemos que sembrar en junio, 
o sea, todo se ha transversado, pero estamos ahí. Y esa es la lucha de hombres y mujeres en el Departamento de la Paz, del movimiento indígena. Eso podría decirles de, de la lucha que hacemos en Honduras y que no la tenemos fácil. Thank you very much. Ms. Pineda for that. And you're absolutely correct that it, there's been numerous reports that indigenous peoples, although we're, we do not contribute to the problems or, or that we're facing in our world today. The, however, we face most of these problems as a re, not as a result of our own actions, but actions of dominant society However, we tend to face the brunt of the negative impacts caused by these. For instance, a lot of times, like you just mentioned, find yourselves at, on the front lines, having to defend your own life, being threatened for the work that you do, and you do it at a very high risk to your well-being. And we thank you for the work that you put in. And you're right, if not us, then who? Because this is very important work that we do. And so... Again, thank you. And I know that we have lost many people in the struggle, including uh, Ms. Berta Caceres, as you mentioned. And so this for us as indigenous peoples, this is a life and death situation. It is, it is something that we have to contend with on a daily basis. I would like to present to you our next presenter and his name is Mr. Pablo Miss. He's Maya Ekchi from Laguna, Toledo, Belize. He's also very passionate about indigenous and grassroots development and has dedicated his energies in helping to build the resilience of Maya people in Southern Belize. Pablo is um, is the program director for the Maya Leaders Alliance. And the Maya Leaders Alliance um, is, is, a, is located in Southern Belize. It is a coalition of Maya organizations and leaders from the Toledo district working collectively to promote the long-term well-being of the Maya people by defending their collective rights to their territories. In fact, in 2015, the Maya Leaders Alliance achieved a victory and a landmark legal decision from the Caribbean Court of Justice that affirmed that the 39 Maya, Kechi, and Mopan communities um, in, in Southern Belize hold customary title to their lands in accordance with Maya customary law. So again, Pablo, welcome. And, and as I mentioned, he's coordinated the work of the Alliance since 2009, including the strategic litigation that I just mentioned. Pablo holds a bachelor's degree for, um, in geography from the University of Hawaii. And currently he's completing his research uh, towards a fulfillment of a master of arts in human and social development with a specialization in indigenous governance at the University of Victoria. Canada. Again, Pablo, thank you for joining us this morning. And our question to you is, it has been seven years since the Caribbean Court of Justice affirmed Maya land rights in Southern Belize, and the government was ordered to implement this order. What has been your experience in implementation of that order? What are some of the challenges that you've faced? And since the order, has there been marked increase of outside pressure on your lands? Uh, what are some of those challenges, particularly in respect of conservation issues, et cetera? The floor is yours, Pablo. Thank you very much, uh, Monica. Greetings to, to everyone on the um, uh, Zoom link. Um, it's a pleasure to be sharing. Uh, let me first of all start by acknowledging the uh, powerful interventions of the previous uh, presenters. I, I want to go back to, I think, a question that uh, Arakana uh, mentioned when we were asked, what do we do to protect nature? And uh, her answer simply is, who we are as Indigenous people is uh, how we protect nature. And I think that is quite fitting then in terms of contextualizing the theme of uh, this morning's uh, um, 
uh, discussion, which is the criminalization of and the violence against indigenous peoples and land defenders. So essentially, it's important to um, uh, uh, put our fingers on the fact that it is the defense of who we are in protecting modern nature that is actually criminalized, that, is, uh, that makes us uh, uh, a target in the work we do. So a little bit about the story of the Maya people um, on the front lines, as uh, Ms. Monica has outlined, a historic land rights uh, uh, victory after 30 years of litigation have uh, essentially um, uh, obligated the government to um, identify where the Maya lands are, to demarcate them, to uh, put in place domestic legislation to protect those lands and the associated rights of the Maya people to those resources. And most importantly, it also bonded the government's hands from issuing um, uh, uh, concessions um, and for selling land within this, this area. Now, it has been seven years, as, uh, as, as the moderators, Ms. Monica, have uh, um, outlined. And I'll try to answer the two questions as briefly as, uh, as I can. Um, clearly, it's important for us to point out that one of the major challenges that we've seen in respect to the implementation of the court order is the simple lack of political will and good faith engagement from the part of the government. Now, that's something that is echoed every year at the permanent forum and at many conferences that we come together um, uh, to discuss our issues on. But I want you to talk a little bit about how we arrive at this, uh, at this conclusion. We see that there is no clear affirmation on the part of the state, the government of Belize, to uphold standards, those standards that, are, have, that have been established um, globally at the international level, especially those that are drawn from uh, international law. So for instance, there's always this uh, conversation about uh, free prior and informed consent. And uh, I read interesting, interestingly, uh, a, a, a article, I think a few days ago, um, questioning when, when does it become an illusion, if it becomes an illusion. Here we are in Belize caught between the discussion of whether it should be EFPIC, um, whether it should be consent or consultation. Again, something that has been an ongoing process of uh, debate between states and indigenous peoples at the global spaces a clear indication of a lack of continued lack of political will and good faith engagement. There's also another element that I wanted to point out that we are currently facing. And that is that the implementation of court orders appear to be uh, from the interpretation, from the uh, uh, understanding of states, merely an extension of their administrative law instrument as a state. And in that context, when they see that uh, it is merely an extension of the administrative uh, uh, law, the law of the state. In, it is their understanding then that all administrative laws of the state are to be developed and decided upon by states, which means government's position ends up isolating and removing the Maya people from being a part of actually constructing what the domestic legislation should be what FPIC should be. They essentially claim to own the implementation in itself as a part of their obligation to protect the, 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 the Maya people and to protect the sovereignty of Belize. So I wanted to point that out. There's also another critical area, and that is the lack of respect for Maya people's representation, Maya people's uh, governance uh, uh, institution. Now, it's important and it's very interesting to see that in the implementation of court orders that the government, like in the case of Belize, is quick then to begin designating or assigning what the governance structure of the Maya people should be. Essentially, after 30 years of litigating the government, now they want to tell the Maya people who should be negotiating on the part of the Maya people with the government. So that's something that's important to always keep in mind, essentially bunching 
uh, indigenous systems of governance as merely another non-governmental organization. A very uh, a detrimental position to take. Now, in terms of, of, of marked uh, increases of pressures from the outside, one of the major challenge we have is the issue of, uh, of third party cases. There have been um, uh, lands in, in the Maya territory that uh, are held uh, privately. And we see now a move to convert those privately held lands into uh, private protected areas. In fact, some of them funded by a very, very uh, well-known royal uh, charity trust. So you see this very quick transition of privately held estates to private properties so that it is uh, a bit difficult to, um, so, so that they can keep it out of the reach of indigenous peoples. Another ma major point to, uh, to, to point out here is in the area of the climate crisis. This uh, response by the state to mitigate and to adapt um, uh, uh, strategies uh, to address climate change. One of the biggest challenge we see is the um, uh, separation of land tenure from uh, uh, forest, uh, forest tenure. So for instance, when we're talking about carbon rights and the government right now is, is, is writing a law on carbon rights, it is removed from land tenure rights of the indigenous people. So essentially, uh, government is making the claim that carbon rights um, are the property of the government and it is not part of the tenure security of the, the Maya people. So my concluding points too very quickly is that we as indigenous peoples, whether we have a court order or not, need to ensure that we continue to be strong in advocating that uh, our rights are realized from, uh, and, and that they're realized and that they're situated within the self-determination paradigm, which means then that state cannot on their own um, implement court orders that are in favor of Maya people. And these are, there's already uh, 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 globally accepted international standards that government are bound to in terms of self-determination of indigenous peoples. And then the last point is that courts, while they have been creative, like in the case of the Caribbean Court of Justice, they supervise the implementation, there needs to be more creativity and more on-point intervention by courts to, to see that their orders are actually being implemented. Otherwise, as in the case of the Maya people, 30 years of litigation and then seven years now of just sitting on an order the Maya people might just be waiting for another 30 years before there's any meaningful change to our to realizing our rights to land. So again, just closing off again by, by Arakana's uh, intervention. We are who we are as indigenous people, and these struggles are very important. And I want to share my solidarity with everybody on the panel and everybody who is on this line who are engaged in trying to defend our rights as indigenous peoples, our rights to protect mother nature. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pablo. And again, thank you for that, for all the panelists that are here today for their very powerful intervention. And as Pablo mentioned, the rule of law is absolutely, absolutely important. Um, if, if we're to continue in a positive way, then we need to res have respect for the rule of law. And that includes um, respect on the part of our governments. Again, one of the things that the, there have been numerous reports in respect of land tenure security um, and its direct impacts on, the, on climate change solutions. And I feel that governments don't respect this enough. In fact, the latest uh, IPBS report found that 65 to 75% of the Earth's surface has been significantly altered by human actions. However, on average, these trends have been less severe or avoided entirely um, on lands that are managed by indigenous peoples because of their, their governance structures that they have in place, the way that they use the land. And so, which has led climate researchers to conclude and I quote, that there is an urgent need to make collective 
tenure security, a critical part of emission reduction strategies, empowering forest peoples to continue their historical role as stewards of the environment is essential for stabilizing Earth's climate. So there is that great need great need to have recognition for uh, indigenous people's land tenure. Again, thank you guys for having us. I would like to introduce our, our last panelist and his name is Silvino Mendoza. And Mr. Mendoza belongs to the Guarani Pai uh, Tabtiera people in Paraguay. He, he is a defender of the territories and rights of his people. He's been chosen to lead the Pai Pireta Hua Association. Are you guys hearing me? Um, and from there, together with his board of directors, they work on various advocacy, communication, and organizational strengthening for the defense of their territories. Um, the context in which the Pai Tierra territories are immersed is characterized again by various tensions, constant invasions, extractivism, and a lack of respect for the indigenous rights by the judicial system. Despite these um, conflicts, Silvino and his team continue their struggle and are very passionate about securing and protecting their ancestral lands. Um, relying on their ancestral knowledge of their people to do so. Again, Mr. Mendoza, welcome. And, uh, the, and our question for you today is, what recommendations do you have for the global community in their approach to fighting climate change, change solutions? The floor is yours. When the other one, Serena Silvina Mendoza, Chamorro, líder de la comunidad Cerro Tango, distrito de la Vista, departamento de Amambay. La primera vez que la asociación será la asociación Paine Tango Ayú. Usted va a como presidente de la asociación. Entonces, Añeta, se ve el asunto de cambio climático. Orengo, justamente, yo recuerdo que se ha hecho a Pú. La oreo de parte de la como pueblo indígena, para estar usted, por eso siempre, por eso acá tengo la cara de porque pesa, de cada gurú, pija, están bajando, oye, un yendero, están bajando, primero, eh, y tú, por allá, a ver, cuando ya mañana, pero el tiempo ya ha puesto de lima, a la usan, ya, 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 usan, ya, de lima, a un yendú la gente, un yendú la gente, cuida porque, causa así, o, o para la cara de Hoy estoy para la tranquera fuera, pobre Yerere, principalmente cuando la unidad la cargura es la comunidad indígena fuera. Y ahora lo voy a decir siempre la cargura por la mía, ya. Entonces, ahora siempre ahora en la casa, no sé por qué te va a ver hoy, que está un niño le ponga cargura, bicho cargura, te haré ahora ni mantener, pues. Entonces, cuando yo diga tu vez más, porque la gente fuera, hoy estoy para la tranquera fuera, la oye, ahora llegué la casa. A pesar de caso, ahora ya ve. Sofía habría ayudado a esta parte, se agradecía a su pega tan mesa, a mi hija, a tan mesa, ahora siempre, no ni Epen Andie, ni Mojapú, ni Mombarete, de la mesa, a tan mesa, la la Cagumia, a mi hija, a mi hija, Mr. Mendoza, Mr. Mendoza, if you can hear me, do you have an interpreter um, next to you? Because we're not, our interpreters are not able to, to, to translate. Sí, eh, sintéticamente el señor Silvino agradece mucho poder participar en este espacio. Considera que es súper importante enriquecer eh, los conocimientos y la experiencia que están teniendo de lucha los diferentes pueblos. Y comenta él que en el país en el que nosotros vivimos, eh, así como escuchamos en otros lugares, los indígenas dependen directamente de lo que es el, el bosque, la biodiversidad, para poder mantener la vida. Hay una relación intrínseca directa entre lo que ocurre en, el, en la vida indígena y lo que ocurre con, con los bosques y la biodiversidad. Entonces lo que, en la gran amenaza y la gran preocupación es que realmente en torno a las comunidades indígenas 
eh, se está destruyendo el, 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 el monte. Principalmente, él se refería a los extranjeros que están en Paraguay, que, que prácticamente Paraguay es muy poco lo que se conoce, lo que ocurre acá adentro, pero hay un, un, una impunidad muy grande y se le criminaliza también a las comunidades indígenas que luchan por defender su territorio. Entonces, él lo que dice es que en los lugares donde viven los indígenas, prácticamente en Paraguay y en todo el planeta se da eso, son los lugares donde hay bosques todavía. Entonces, es muy importante que se proteja y que realmente pueda haber una conservación y un reconocimiento de la gente indígena que está haciendo ese trabajo. Eso por un lado. Y no sé, le puedo dar otra vez la palabra para que él continúe con más ideas al respecto y después continúe la traducción. Entonces te habla principalmente la yepia, pero por el coaja, pero siente con la niña muy baja, habría de ir a niña a como básico y nada como indígena, burbisa, vaso, hace yo de niña a ver y que todo más sabría cualquier cosa de la cara espera, ya quiero fuera yo, no hay que todo más a la ayuda y que todo más a la para toda la comunidad, porque la espera, pues te pago la cara. Entonces, pues cada cosa que te hace, cosas por ejemplo, no hay ley por nada, porque ya se ha pedido con este bebé, y ya se ha repetido mi gente a mi simil, porque es para cualquier ley, para usar ya de cada uno, usar interés. Entonces, también, eh, lo que quería decir es que la gran preocupación que tiene ahora es como en, en esta zona es que los periodos de, de calor son demasiado intensos. Y los periodos de lluvia son demasiado intensos y los periodos de frío también se, se expande demasiado. Eso implica también que ya está, está en riesgo la salud de la gente y también está en riesgo el, el tema de lo que tiene que ver con el agua y la comida, porque últimamente también empieza a escasear la comida. Y otro tema que también es interesante tener en cuenta es el uso, lo que él dice es que se debe son las personas que, que destruyen la naturaleza quienes tienen que tomar también medidas para, para que se pueda volver a conservar. Entonces, las políticas de conservación y las políticas de, de protección del bosque tienen que ser responsabilidad de todos en su conjunto. No solamente es escuchar a la, la parte indígena, que es sumamente importante, clave e indispensable, pero que también principalmente los estados que tienen responsabilidad en eso puedan tener responsabilidades en la conservación. Exactamente. Eh, por otra parte, tengo la unión de la cueva de Mapua, un invierno amenazo, tú sabes que ahí oré, porque ya, ya esa es la pena de la indígena, no puedo recordar la cueva de Mapua. Pero yo puro ahí a la hora de caer. A mí me tiene amenaza, tú sabes que ahí a la hora de parte de BJP, ahí la hora de la hora de reclamo, ahí que otra muestra, pues está la gobierno fuera de día. Sí, de forma. Ah, pero un pipe vemos, ¿eh? A mí me debe ahora el cimiento, millón de horas de cimiento, a mí me debe, a mí me debe, a mí me debe, a mí me debe, muchas gracias. El último elemento que él comentaba y compartía tiene que ver con el, en la zona particularmente en la que vivimos en el territorio de Amambay, está rodeada también, las, los territorios indígenas también están bajo la amenaza del narcotráfico, que también amenazan los bosques, que son gran, los grandes remanentes de bosque que hay en la zona, y que también el narcotráfico incide en la, en la desprotección y en la pérdida de la biodiversidad, y además él comenta que hay una presión eh, y está amenazado también, él está amenazado su vida también en los últimos tiempos porque, porque hacen ese trabajo de defensa. Entonces es importante para despedirse, bueno, agradece mucho la, el espacio, agradece poder compartir y también manifiesta eso, ¿verdad? Que, que es importante que los derechos de, humanos de los pueblos indígenas puedan ser garantizados en toda su, su dimensión. Hasta ahí su palabra. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Savino and your interpreter. 
We really appreciate your contributions and you're absolutely right that there are so many challenges that face us as indigenous peoples as we continue to defend our territories. Uh, you know, our lives are being threatened and by various things and you are absolutely correct in highlighting that the different activities such as drug trafficking is not uncommon and it does uh, contribute to biodiversity loss. And it's unfortunate that these are some of the things that we're having to deal with as indigenous people on our territories. Again, in the interest of time, I wanna thank each one of our panelists for their very powerful, powerful contributions. We, we do have one question. So we are gonna move to the question and answer session before we move to concluding remarks. And there's one question and maybe one of the panelists um, could take this question. It says, do you think the OAS and the UN do enough to protect us as indigenous people? Do you think the OAS and the UN are in conflict with protecting our rights since they are funded by our oppressors slash de facto governments? So the, this is the question that's being posed and perhaps um, what we can do is we can go around and give each one of the panelists time to maybe reflect on this and then also include that in your concluding remarks. You have uh, two minutes each and perhaps we'll start with Ms. Uh, Chepkemoy. And then we'll go to uh, Ms. Sereng and in the same order that we were before. Thank you. Ms. Yunus, are you there and can you hear us? Okay, she does not appear to be there. So we'll move on to Ms. Sereng. You have the floor. Uh, yeah, uh, so I would like to share that I think it's really important when we are talking about uh, indigenous people and local communities communities and protection of the environmental defenders one of my key observation is that all the institutions and organizations even in the united nation work in silos and i think this is the biggest challenge it's really important that we work in an intersectional way because i think there are a lot of policies and there are a lot of initiatives being done but again when the implementations comes it's again mostly overlapping or contradictory or there are multiple things which again has a challenge in terms of the implementation so i would like to propose that for example we have climate action policies we have sustainable development goals, and we have country legislations and international frameworks on biodiversity con conversation i think it's important that we do not keep indigenous people in a bracket or in a separate paragraph in the policies i think indigenous people's issues in indigenous people's leadership and participation needs to be weaved around in the policy making framework it needs to be weaved around in the entire conversation and not keeping it in the silos and thus i would like to see and propose and urge that more and more intersection of indigenous issues in the climate policy framework biodiversity conversation framework and i think the second thing which is really important for us in terms of when we are talking about indigenous issues and indigenous people is we have more indigenous people representation across the globe i think representation has been a key challenge where we see there has been uh, non adequate representation of indigenous people and which also brings down to the fact that there has been immense indigenous people advocacy and indigenous people working out on ground i think it's really important by all the institutions to identify indigenous people to identify young indigenous women uh, and to identify indigenous people those who are uh, working in different spheres which also brings down to my last point is that we should not treat indigenous people as mere indigenous people we indigenous people have different expertise in different thematics and we have been doing great work in all the sphere whether it is research academia uh, whether it is in terms of science or whether it is in terms of grassroots mobilization uh, community-led initiatives 
our traditional knowledge and practices and thus i would like to urge to see us as expertise in our own work and have been doing uh, things in a very concrete way and a sustainable way where it brings to the fact that i think that so we need to stop tokenizing indigenous people and local community uh, and need to make them an integral part of the climate decision making process i end by saying that we are here willing to support and contribute uh, towards uh, the sustainable development goals and climate action processes i think it's important that we are on the same table working together thank you Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Ms. Sarang. You are absolutely right. We need to be at the center of these de decision-making processes, not merely on the sidelines, because we do come with, with great expertise in, in, in these areas, not only in our traditional knowledge, but like you said, in research and academia. So thank you for that. And uh, with that, I give the floor to Ms. Margarita Pineda for her closing remarks. Ms. Pineda. Eh, sí, eh, recuerdo, de acuerdo a la pregunta, déjeme decirle que lo que es la OEA, lo ACNUD y otros organismos internacionales, dado eh, la situación en Honduras, eh, se llamó la atención bastante de estos, de estos organismos y se hicieron presentes que nunca habíamos tenido eh, un representante de la ACNUD en Honduras y ahora se tuvo en este periodo pasado. Y sí, eh, las políticas dentro del marco internacional, por ejemplo, para la defensa de tierra, territorio y bienes comunes, déjeme decirle que la Unión Europea ha invertido mucho dinero, mucho, mucho dinero, y ha salido como, eh, como al pueblo indígena se nos ha tomado como un pueblo pobre, miserable, eh, y los políticos en este momento eh, sacaron mucho dinero, eh, no solo donaciones, sino que también préstamos para el desarrollo económico, político, social, para los pueblos indígenas. Es algo que nos tiene muy indignados porque ahora que se hacen unas auditorías y salen millones y millones de lempiras que fueron invertidos en desarrollo, erradicación de la pobreza, cosa que no fue cierto, eso lo invirtieron ellos, se lo robaron y como es, ha sido conocido a nivel mundial, Honduras ha sido uno de los países más corruptos, el gobierno, eh, el narcotráfico y ahorita podemos ver eh, a los, al mes, a los 60 días de haber dejado el poder, Juan Orlando ya está en Estados Unidos siendo juzgado como el mayor... Eh, líder del cártel de la droga, ah, quizás a nivel de Latinoamérica, porque siendo gobernante, manejó desde allí. Entonces podemos ver que eh, como pueblos originarios y pueblos indígenas hicimos una lucha porque sabíamos que estaba el lavado de activos, incluso los fondos eh, eh, para las empresas extractivas, eran unos fondos de dudosa procedencia y fueron pocos los fondos que se lograron eh, identificar de dónde venían. Entonces, sí, por ejemplo, ahorita eh, la misma Unión Europea ha invert está invirtiendo muchos fondos para la recuperación eh, de la biodiversidad y estamos en eso. Y esperamos que con el gobierno de Xiomara y con todos los compañeros que hemos llegado allí, porque quiera o no, déjeme decirle que el pueblo Lenca eh, ha sido uno de los que más apoyamos y luchamos para lograr llevar este sistema de gobierno. Tenemos convenios firmados con la presidenta y estamos ahí en recuperar, derogar eh, leyes, decretos legislativos, PCMs, donde se, se privatizó todo eh, nuestro ancestral indígena. Entonces estamos en eso y las formas tradicionales de Defensoría de Derechos Humanos, pues ahí vamos. Y como dice nuestro himno nacional, eh, serán muchos Honduras tus muertos, pero todos caerán con honor. Y estamos ahí. Gracias.
Thank you very much, Ms. And with that, in the interest of time, I'll move on to Mr. Pablo Miss. You have two minutes for your closing remarks. Thank you very much. Just to respond to the question, I think that was asked whether the OAS or the UN um, has done enough. Uh, I think the, the bottom line to that is there's a need for us indigenous peoples to be organized in our communities. In other words, we have to have a base, we have to have communities, we have to have our own governance structure. There's no way we're going to realize self-determination through a borrowed governance structure or through borrowed uh, 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 social processes. It has to be rooted. What we do in the process of self-determination, whether it is land rights, climate change, social inclusion, it has to be done on the premise that we're building our own system of governing our own internal and external affairs as a, as a people. So that's fundamental. The second point then is that uh, there are there are advances within both the, the, the UN and the OS uh, systems. However, we need to be able to know how to utilize them. There's so much that's going on, but there are obligations that our governments have, uh, have agreed to, have acceded to. Um, there are opportunities, I think, that, uh, that we could make use of. For instance, for indigenous peoples, there's the uh, indigenous fellowship that's offered by the um, Office of the High Commissioner on uh, Human Rights. Uh, it's every year and it trains um, uh, indigenous peoples on the front line to understand the various procedures, mechanisms, treaty bodies. Uh, and, and, and then the idea is that you return to your community to help to use those systems to your advantage, to increase the advocacy against uh, in the work that you're doing against the government. There's also the UN Voluntary Fund on Indigenous Issues that supports the participation of Indigenous peoples at key meetings. Now, uh, the fund normally will not pay for people to just go to New York. But if you submitted reports to the thematic study, if you are uh, submitting reports to CERD, to the UPR, likely the fund will support you so that it's more than just your written reports. It also brings your face and your voice in the corridors and the rooms of discussion within the UN systems. Um, but it requires, again, as I said, organizing. Um, I think similarly with OAS, there, there's a lot of catching up that needs to be done there. The Inter-American Commission um, is, a, is a mechanism, I think, that has been trying to, to do good work. Um, they recently concluded the revision of the, not concluded, but the, the call for input into their strategic plan. Um, so I think, again, it's important that we are organized not only in our communities, but in the regional uh, 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 mechanisms of indigenous people's representations so that our priorities can actually form part of the mandates of these regional entities such as the UN and the OAS. So I just wanted to make those two contributions based on our experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Pablo. And now I go move on to Mr. Mendoza. You have two minutes for closing remarks. Lo que plantea el señor Silvino es que la experiencia como, como nación, como pueblo, país de eh, la incidencia que tiene Naciones Unidas ahora con respecto a, a las políticas ambientales y a lo que tiene que ver con la defensa del territorio es muy incipiente. No, no existen grandes apoyos, no existen grandes convenios. En Paraguay todavía Naciones Unidas no, no tiene es, es demasiada incidencia con el pueblo indígena. El único, el único acercamiento que, que tuvieron fue hace como un año con una... Um, con, una, con, un fondo, con un fondo de pequeños proyectos que tenía una duración de un año. Entonces lo que, lo que vemos acá es que en realidad la, la incidencia que tiene Naciones Unidas no es demasiado fuerte y es necesaria por todas estas cuestiones que están ocurriendo principalmente con el tema ambiental y, y cómo en, en otras agencias, en otros países, tienen quizá mayor acercamiento a los pueblos indígenas. Hasta 
All right, thank you very much, Mr. Mendoza. And again, thank you very much to all the panelists that were here this morning. We want to thank you for taking time out to enlighten us. And again, I want to, to make sure that I mention that this site event was made possible um, by Cultural Survival and our partners, Minority Rights Group International and the Maya Leaders Alliance of Southern Belize. I encourage you to check out their respective websites and to learn more about the work that we do. Again, Cultural Survival. My name is Monica Cook Magnuson. I, I am the Director of Advocacy and Policy here at Cultural Survival. Cultural Survival is a 50 year old indigenous rights, indigenous led organization based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And we've been working with, our work is predicated on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, where we work to empower indigenous peoples as they strive to assert their rights to self determination determination and to sustain their lands, cultures, cultures and vital ecosystems. And so we have 29 staff based in 10 countries and our staff is majority women and both staff and board are majority indigenous. Again, minority rights group, international campaigns worldwide with around 150 partners in 50 countries to ensure that the disadvantaged, that disadvantaged minorities and indigenous peoples often the poorest of the poor uh, can make their voices heard. Again, the Maya Leaders Alliance is a coalition of Maya, Maya, Maya leaders um, from Southern Belize and that are working collectively to promote the long-term well-being of the Maya people in Southern Belize by defending their collective rights. Again, thank you so much for being with us here on the front lines, criminalization of and, and violence against indigenous peoples and indigenous land defenders. You've heard a very powerful interventions today um, that highlight the struggles that indigenous peoples face as they defend their lands and territories, but also the very in valuable contributions that, that that towards the protection of mother nature again i i off I, I will end by saying that if the international or the global community is serious about fighting climate change then indigenous peoples have to be at the center of decision making processes and it must take a human rights based approach whenever it's developing these policies so again thank you all very much for joining us and i hope you all have a great rest of the day and Good luck uh, as you continue to fight and protect your territories. And again, uh, thanks and, and peace be to you for this, to, for this day. Thank you.